Okay, so I'm transition to live. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our afternoon session of aid. This afternoon, we are pleased to have Kevin Dill working with us. Kevin Dill uh, currently is working at Lockheed Martin, and I, when I first announced this on Twitter, some people were a little bit surprised um, at you know Lockheed Martin games, but Kevin Dill is not only the game AI architecture lead um, at Lockheed Martin, but he also has a long history not only of working on games like um, Iron Man, Zoo Tycoon, Red Dead Redemption, and other games like this, um, but he also has had a long history with aid and was uh, very instrumental for many years in helping out with the organization of the conference and with industry relations there. So we're really happy today that we could have Kevin Dill come back and speak to us about some of the things that he's learned in his years from the industry and the types of things that will be interesting for him if we were to, the types of problems that are particularly interesting to him. So let's welcome Kevin Dill. So back in 1999, um, I took sort of a circuitous route to getting into work. Um, I went to undergrad, and then I went, to, went into the Army for four years, and I came out of the Army, and I knew I wanted to work in games. Um, but I didn't know anything about games. I didn't know how games worked. I didn't, you know, I, I played a lot of games, and, and I'd done a lot of programming, um, but I didn't really know how games were made, and, and I wasn't even sure where to begin. So I said, all right, well, I'll go to grad school. But that seems like the obvious thing to do. Uh, I ended up at University of Pittsburgh. Um, and while I was there, I discovered a passion for AI. Um, and, and really for this question of why is AI so stupid, right? And particularly, why is the AI game so stupid? But why is AI, why are computers in general so stupid? And how do we make them smarter? Um, and I never really thought about AI before. So in 1999, I discovered that AAAI had a spring symposium on AI and computer games, uh, which I went to. Um, and it was fantastic, right? It, it, it was the, the progenitor of it. It eventually grew into AID, that series of symposia. Um, and it, much like AID, um, really aimed to bring together industry and academia. And it was probably about 50-50 back then. So there were a whole bunch of really smart industry guys and a whole bunch of really smart academic guys and, and little clueless me wandering around just soaking up the knowledge. Um, so my goal here today, in some ways, is, is to try and recreate that. Um, and give sort of, for especially the academics in the room, sort of an industry view of, of what is game AI, right? How is it different than what I'll, what I'll call real AI? And I think that that's a very fair dichotomy. Um, and how is it made? Um, and the real goal is to get at, you know, why do we do it the way that we do it? Because I think it's easy to look at games and go, man, the AI is stupid, right? And the same way that I found it. It would be so simple, you just have to do this one check and then it would know, right? Well, it's, it's not, but why do we do it the way that we do it? Um, and to help you understand that so that you can help us do it better. Um, sorry, I'm supposed to help. I don't know, I know what time it is. Um, that work. Um, so, so that's the goal. I'm gonna start with some sort of abstract game designy, what is a game, what is AI kind of stuff. Um, and then, I, but I really want to drill down into the concrete, right? I really want to get into details and show you some videos and some examples and talk about what we were trying to do, um, and then you know how we how we went about doing it. Um, but I don't want to drill into the concrete like this, right? I don't want to be destructive. It's easy to look at games and go, the AI is stupid. It does. It still walks into walls. Why haven't we solved that problem yet, right? And it's true. It does. But what much more interesting to me is. Um, what does it look like when it's right, right? And, and why do we take the approaches that we do? And I think, it, and I'll probably say this a bunch of times, I think AI is one of those things that when it goes right, nobody really notices, right? Because they're just, they're immersed in the experience, they're playing the game, they're having fun, they're not thinking about what the AI is doing. But when it goes wrong, all of a sudden, <laughs> everybody notices. Um, so, but I see, right, so, oh, okay, there we go. Right, not the jackhammer, the drill. Um, and then I want to leave you with a few resources, because the other thing that I hear a lot of people say is that as an academic, it's very hard to know what games are about. Um, either they, you know, they don't know where the information is, they don't know how to find it, um, or it's very expensive. Um, and they, you know, they can't afford to go to GDC, and I can appreciate that. I can't either. I get my boss to send me. Um, so, the, but there are some really good resources out there, and I want to make you aware of some of them, and from those, you can probably find the rest. 
A few quick side notes. Um, this just amused me. Um, I was talking to Katya before her talk, and we realized that we're giving like our two talks at the converse of each other. And she's talking about how can games help AI and provide an environment where you can do AI experimentation. I'm talking about how AI can, can help games. But the interesting thing is, the sets of AI techniques that we talk about are probably very close to being discrete sets. Um, and that's just sort of fun. And, they, and yet they have this joining factor of being around games and being interesting to talk about at this conference. Um, I also want to be really clear that there's no criticism intended. Hopefully that's obvious anyway. Um, there are lots of really fun, hard problems in the world. There are lots of really fun, hard problem, AI problems. Some of them are relevant to games. Some of them are not. Um, I don't mean to say that if you want to build real humans, you know, well, that's crazy. Why would you want to do it? Right? That's not what I mean to say. That's a really cool problem. It's just not the problem that I, ha I t happen to work on, and it's not really that useful for me. It's interesting, but it's not really useful for me. Yeah, until you solve it, at which point it will be. <laughs> Also, none of this is specific to games, right? So the same techniques that work for games work for training, can work for education, can work really anywhere where you need essentially expert systems, where you need hand-authored, uh, hand-controlled decision-making decision algorithms. So, with all of that aside, um, the abstract stuff. What is a game? This is one of those, like I know it when I see it, right? Well, game is fun, all right, so what is fun? Um, I mean, it's a tic-tac-toe game, because tic-tac-toe isn't fun, right? <laughs> so, but it's a game, I think. It's ch chess, is a, chess is obviously a game, right? StarCraft is a game. There's not that much in common between chess and StarCraft, but then, I mean, they both have some strategy, I guess. Um, but it's very, very different, right? Chess is turn-based um, and, and very simple. StarCraft is very complex in certain ways. Um, Left for Dead is a game. It's got almost nothing in common with chess, and well, it's on a computer, so it's got that in common with StarCraft, right? it uses graphics. Um, lately, so, all right, I clicked too soon. Um, so, game designers have a hard time defining this themselves, right? And, it, and there are, you know, over the years, there have been these moments when game designers said something that seemed profound, right? Sid Meier, a game is a, a series of interesting decisions. Um, Raph Koster really talks about mastery and how games are about learning and the process of mastering something. Um, and all of those, those explanations are valid, right? And, and they're good for some set of games, but they don't seem to cover everything, right? You can find counterexamples where games aren't about interesting decisions or aren't about mastery. Um, recently, a lot of people have been sort of congealing around this term experience. I've been using it for a couple of years. Um, but, it, but I think, you know, it's central in, in Jesse Schell's book, The Art of Game Design, which I really recommend, by the way. Um, it's a fantastic book. It's got very little about, if anything, about AI in it, but it's a really fun book. Um, but games are really about creating an experience. Um, and it doesn't have to be just fun, right? There's, a, there's more to an experience than fun, or it could be a different experience than fun. Um, so I recently have started playing World of Warcraft again after about five years away. Um, and something that Blizzard does really, really well, and that games can do, I think, better than any other medium, better than movies, better than role-playing games, better than books, is giving you a sense of embodiment, a sense of being there in the world, in this fantastic environment. Um, so, so my character is a blacksmith, right? And to improve his blacksmithing, and he's pretty elite now, he's level 110, um, to improve his blacksmithing, he has to climb to this tiny enclave of smiths and miners who live at the top of the highest mountain way up in the Northlands. Um, and it's this long, arduous trek, just finding the path is difficult. And you, you reach this point where you have to go across this narrow, rickety wood and rope bridge, and the wind is howling, and this, you know, the mist is blowing by, super, right? The, the screenshot really doesn't do it justice. And you get out in the middle of this bridge, and I mean, the bridge isn't actually shaking underneath you, right? I mean, it's just geometry, it's set in the world. You're not gonna, there's no reason why you would fall off. I think you probably you can't fall off, although I haven't tried. Um, but your, your gut drops out, right? And it's the same feeling that I had when I was hiking in Hawaii, and I was doing these knife bridges that are five feet wide, and it drops off on a cliff on either side, and there's no reason why you would walk three feet to the side and drop away. But if you did, you know, it would, it would all be over. Um, and it, you know that sort of embodiment, Blizzard does that very, very well. Um, but that's, I think that video, that movies can't do it as well because they're not interactive, right? You're not interacting with the environment around you. And books and role-playing games can't do it as well because they don't have the visual aspect, right? You're not pulled into it. Um, so this is something that games sort of are uniquely good at. Um, but it, you know, it can be other things too, right? It can be a sense of teamwork, right? Partnership, 
trust, right? That I saved your life and you saved mine, right? And if we weren't here for each other, you know, we'd be through. Left for Dead is all about that sense of teamwork. And they, they built the game very much about having monsters, zombies in their case, um, that you know can just grab one guy and hold him down right, and kill him. And only if another one of the players comes to his aid will he survive, right? World of Warcraft also does teamwork very well in the high level rating. Other games do it well. But for Left for Dead, that is what their experience is about. Um, and you also happen to shoot some zombies, right? But it's not about the zombies. It's about the teamwork. Um, it can be about not really story. Games don't do story very well, partly because they're interactive, partly because players won't sit still long enough to notice the story. Um, but they can do drama, they can do character, they can do tragedy and angst. Um, the Last of Us is a very good example, right? It's really about this character who's lived this very tragic life, again, in a zombie apocalypse. Um, and his relationship with his past, his relationship with this young girl, Ellie, who happens to be an AI character, Right, so you know the AI is important when it's taking on the role of the, of the support, you know, the primary support actor in the story. Um, and then, you know, that's what that experience is about. And again, you happen to shoot some zombies along the way. And the zombie shooting is built to support that experience. Um, but it's not the core of the experience. The core of the experience in that case is, is the story, or the, you know, the drama. Something that's very important to realize is that the experience is not the game. Right? The game is not the experience. When you create the game, you are not creating the experience. You're creating the thing that is going to create the experience. The experience happens inside of the player's head. It's internal to the player. So you have this sort of second order of removal from the thing that you're creating, where you have to create this game that is then going to create this experience for the player. Um, and the experience may not be the same for every player. And depending on the game, that might be a good thing or a bad thing, right? Blizzard is really, really good at creating these incredibly beautiful, polished, elegant experiences. Um, and World of Warcraft, for instance, has a lot of experiences in it, right? There's the high-level rating experience. There's the exploration experience. There's the PvE experience. There's the PvP experience. There's, you know, there's all these different experiences, but each one is tightly constrained so that you play it the way they intend it to be played. Right? When you're doing high level rating, you have to be at this level and you have to have gear at least this good. And you have to have this mix of classes or this mix of capabilities and this many people. Right? And it's very carefully crafted. And then they can you know, make it into this sort of elegant dance that they do. Um, at the other end of the spectrum is a game like Minecraft, right? where they just say, here's a, a bunch of blocks, go play. Right? It's like a kid with, it, with their blocks in their toy box. Um, and you, the experience is, is almost anything. In fact, they don't even tell you how to play the game, right? You load up Minecraft, there's no instructions. There's that, right? You start plunking the keys on the keyboard and trying to figure out what things do. Um, and some people like me never get past that stage with that game. Um, but some people like my kid do all sorts of crazy stuff with it and really have fun just playing with it. Um, so a very different type of game. So you need to know what type of experience you're creating. Um, and then the techniques that you use will be different in support of that experience. So what goes into crafting one of these experiences? Most of this is, is probably obvious, so I'll fly through it quickly. Obviously, the graphics, um, even the art style, needs to be in support of the experience, right? An art style like um, World of Warcraft uses a very cartoony art style. That wouldn't work for The Last of Us, right? The Last of Us is very photorealistic and very gritty. Um, rendering technology also ties into it. Despite the fact that it uses a very cartoony art style, World of Warcraft actually has you know, quite a bit of high-end rendering you know, with particles and and uh, shaders and all that good stuff, so that they can make that look very, very good. Um, sound and audio are easy to overlook, especially for players like me who tend to turn them off. Um, but they have a big impact on the experience. And as game developers, we can learn a lot from the movie industry. Um, and one of the things that we can learn from them is how important music is, right? Most people, when they're watching a movie, aren't even conscious of the fact that there's music there. But if you take the music away, the movie is much more hollow. It's a huge part of putting you in the emotional space for that movie. Of course, the challenge that, that audio folks in video games have is that the experience is dynamic. So the music needs to be dynamic. It needs to be able to change. Um, it needs to be different depending on what's going on. Game design is obviously central to the experience, right? They are the arbiters of the experience. The job of the game designer, in part, is to say, this is what the experience is, and go around and explain that to everybody, and make sure everybody's got the same experience in their head and is working together, and you know, sign off that everything supports it. Um, 
They also create large parts of the experience, right? Through level design, through encounter design, right? Those high level world raids are very carefully crafted experiences. And even through the game mechanics, right? Even little things like when you open the inventory, does the game pause? Well, that depends on the experience, right? If you want the experience to be very intense, very scary, where, you know, like opening your inventory and messing around with the stuff in your bags is high risk, and you need to like go find a corner and hide and do it quick, and then, you know, so you don't get killed, then don't pause the game when, when the inventory opens. But if you want more of a normal sort of laid-back role-playing game experience, then the game usually pauses. Um, where there are safe places to do it. But underneath all of this, and, and often not noticed, is what the stuff does in the game, right? All of the objects, all of the characters in the game, how do they behave? What do they do, right? From the big, high-level, you know, character behavior, uh, opposing player behavior, down to little stuff, right? If you're making a first-person shooter game, and you give the player a nine millimeter pistol and a 45 magnum pistol, right? Then when they fire that pistol, the 45 magnum needs to have a big boom, right? And it needs to have a bigger kickback and a longer recovery. That's a little piece of behavior, a small behavior controller that's having a profound effect on, on you know, now they get the 45, so well, now I got the big gun, right? So, you know, that's part of that experience. Um, so this is the AI. Right? This is what game AI is, is crafting that behavior. And in some ways, you know, I've made the argument that the, the behavior is the game. The game is the behavior. Right? The, these two are, are very tightly tied together. Um, and you can do a lot of different things with art, maybe, or sound. But if your behavior isn't there and isn't right, then your game isn't what you wanted it to be. So, so game design and AI go very, very closely together. Um, I sometimes say right, that there are lots of different de definitions for AI, right? AI is trying to invent intelligence, AI is you know, robotics, self-driving cars, AI is all the hard problems that we don't know how to solve yet, and as soon as we solve it, it's not AI anymore. Um, that, that's kind of a self-serving definition, I think. But, um, but some people like that one. Um, for game AI specifically, right, and I am, game AI, again, I think is sort of discrete from real AI. Um, AI is the thing that makes the decisions. It's the thing that drives the behavior. Um, so people say, well, well, then is an if statement game AI, right? I mean, surely an if statement is an AI. Um, but yes, yes, it can, right? I wouldn't say every if statement is AI. Um, but you can build game AI with just carefully nested if statements, right? It's making decisions. It's a really bad way to do it, right? It's going to be brittle. It's, it's not going to be extensible. When the game designer comes and needs to change something, you're screwed. But, but you can do it that way. And, some naive game developers, when they first start, take that approach. Um, you really want to point out behavior trees to those guys. Uh, <laughs> but it, I think it was Brian Schwab. I might be misattributing this quote. Um, but back in, in sort of the 1999 era, um, made the statement that the point of game AI is not to win, but to lose with style. Right? And this is overly simple, because not, you know, sometimes you want a really, really hard AI. And so it should be trying as hard as it can to win. Um, sometimes the game isn't about winning and losing, but you're still creating behavior. You're still creating experience. Um, but it gives the sense of it, right? So, so this isn't an optimization problem, right? From the point of view of a game developer, Deep Blue or, or AlphaGo, like, these are horrible failures, right? Because who wants to play an AI that's just going to wipe the floor with you? That's not fun, right? That's not an experience I want to have. Um, so, you know, it, again, there, no criticism. They're really, really cool things. We learn a ton from them, right? They're awesome efforts, I'm glad they happen. But the techniques that they use are not the kinds of techniques that we would want to use in games, because that's not what we want to do. The other problem with them is that they don't play like humans, and we're trying to create the experience of playing against a human. So, you know, much more important to us is that it plays the way that's going to be fun to play against than that it does a good job of winning. Um, so it's, you're optimizing for something very abstract, if you, you can even think of it as an optimization problem. So essential to creating this kind of thing, right, to having the AI play the way that it would be fun to play against is authorial control. The game designer, or at the very least an AI programmer who's sort of a proxy for the game designer, needs to have the ability to go in and, and change and tune and tweak and design the way the AI is going to behave. And there are different approaches. I'm gonna not, not going to dig into the types of reasoning approaches we use. That's easy to find. 
Um, but there are different approaches. Behavior trees I mentioned are one of the most prominent ones right now um, that give good tools for authorial control. So game AI is really about, in some ways, um, human author decision making. Um, which means, that, okay, yeah, I just said that, moving on. Um, but, but the flip side of that, again, is that uh, we can take inspiration from cinematography, uh, but we face, like the audio guys, unexpected and unpredictable events. So we can't just have completely scripted AI, right? We can't, a movie, the AI is really simple, right? You just make the animation for what you want the character to do, that's what it's gonna do. There's no decision making, there's no uncertainty, the movie's gonna be what it's gonna be, right? From the, from the movie creator's point of view, from the audience's point of view, there might be uncertainty. Um, so we need some level of autonomy, and how much autonomy we have, again, is a design decision, right? The, the AI in a Blizzard game is usually very tightly constrained. If you look at the boss battles um, in World of Warcraft, they're very, very scripted. Um, and that's what makes the game fun. The, what makes that game fun is that you exploit the bad AI and take advantage of the fact that this boss is predictable so that you can beat it, right? The boss is this huge, super powerful, godlike giant that would destroy you, except that he always puts a big circle on the ground before he throws a fireball there so you can move out of the way. And he does this ability every 30 seconds so you know to run this way, right? And so, and so exploiting the AI is, is the experience in that game. And that, in some ways, that's kind of cool. In other games, if you're building AI for a real-time strategy game and you want the single-player game to be taken seriously, um, then that's not nearly as cool. Um, or maybe you're building AI for a real-time strategy game and you want the AI to be sort of a tutorial that teaches the player basic strategy, right? And then you have a whole different kind of experience you're trying to create. So. Back in 99, uh, one of the talks was by Ernest Adams, a famous game designer at the time. Um, I think he's, he's gone into academia now. Um, he gave this talk called Putting the Ghost in the Machine. Um, and one of the quotes, this is a little bit of an aside, but one of the quotes he said, which, which I love, is, um, see if I can get this right, just like poetry is the art of language, video games are the art of AI. And what I love about that is it gets at how tightly coupled video games and AI are, right? The behavior is really central to the thing we're creating. Um, but more relevantly, he had this great comparison he did where he said that an AI programmer is like a stage magician, right? Because I don't know if you know this, but um, when the stage magician gets up on stage, he's not really doing magic. Um, <laughs> it's actually a trick, right? It's fake. Um, so he doesn't really cut the woman in half. Um, really, it's two, it's two women. The, the one on the right has her knees tucked up on her chest really, really tight, and the one on the left has been over at the waist um, with her, her head between her legs, and they're so flexible that they can fit in the box like that. Um, so, in much the same way, an AI programmer is not really creating intelligence. An AI programmer is creating the illusion of intelligence, right? We're using tricks and techniques to make it seem like there's intelligent behavior going on. Um, but it's really just, at some level, if statements under the covers, right? Um, carefully crafted if statements, probably with some nice way of organizing them, like a behavior tree or a machine learning algorithm. Um, games don't usually use machine learning algorithms, but in principle, you could. Um, and if we do this successfully, then the player will suspend their disbelief, right? The player is a willing participant in this experience. They want to be immersed in this game, right? That's why they spent $60 on it, right? That's why they're spending time with it, right? They, they want to be immersed in it. Um, so this, again, is an, uh, a notion that comes out of cinematography, out of the movie industry, right? So when you're watching a movie, um, you're not actually in a spaceship slingshotting around the moon to fly in an asteroid where you're gonna plant a nuclear bomb to blow it up before it destroys the Earth, right? You're not really there, but for that two hours, you completely, like, you're transported, right? You're immersed in that experience. You've suspended your disbelief, even though if you were to stop to think about it, intellectually, you know that this isn't real. You're not conscious of the people around you. You're in the movie. Um, unless something happens that's so incredibly unrealistic that your brain just can't accept it, right? No, 
like, you know, it doesn't matter where you bury the nuclear bomb as long as it goes 50 feet under the ground, 49 and a half isn't good enough. Um, or you slingshot around the moon, and it doesn't matter that the weight of the spacecraft's changed, right? Physics isn't really relevant here, so that's irrelevant. Um, and then it, for other people, it might be other movies and other things, but most people have had this experience where it was, it was so unrealistic that the suspension of disbelief was shattered. Right, and you merge back up out from the movie and now you're packed in this theater with smelly people all around you and like, can we just go home now? Um, once, as a, as a developer, once you've lost your audience, right, once you've broken the suspension of disbelief, it can be very, very hard to get them back. Usually it's impossible, right? So I will never enjoy watching that particular movie. Um, it just, it's too unbelievable for me. Other people think it's the best movie ever, you know, more power to them, right? Different people are different. The same is true of AI, right? If the AI does something so completely unbelievable um, or unacceptable for whatever reason that it breaks the suspension of disbelief, then the player is just going to think, oh, this game has sleep in AI. And they're either going to play multiplayer or they're going to put the game on the shelf and go do something else, right? And, and it's over. Um, so the most important rule of game AI is don't do anything stupid, right? Thus the, the title of the talk, Avoiding Artificial Stupidity. Um, Really, if you don't do anything grossly dumb, um, then the players will suspend their disbelief and enjoy interacting with your game. It's when you do something visibly wrong um, that suspension of disbelief gets broken. And this isn't to say that we're perfect at this, right? I mean, this happens all the time. Making games is really, really hard um, and really, really fast-paced. There's not a lot of time. There's a lot of money behind what's got to happen. And, and if you fail, a lot of money gets lost. So there's a lot of stress and anxiety too. Um, but that is the most important thing to try and accomplish. Um, so I came across this talk just this last weekend. Um, and I had to stick it into to my talk because it was awesome. And I was talking about a lot of the same things. Um, so if you get a chance, I encourage you to go look it up. It's out on YouTube. Um, Dr. Kimberly Ball gave a talk at the Independent Game Summit at GDC in 2015. Um, Foolishly, I didn't put the title of the talk on here, so hopefully that's enough to be able to find it. Um, somebody bother me and I'll find the link and email it around. You had Nathan has the link. Um, <laughs> so, um, and she's, a, you know, she's got a PhD in computer science, she's got a degree in cognitive science, she's a game developer, and you're seeing a lot of people in the games industry these days who bring these three pieces of expertise together. Um, but some of what she talked about um, is really finding ways to work with the brain. Um, let the brain work for you. Use an understanding of cognitive science and, and psychology. Um, take advantage of the kinds of things the brain naturally does to create that illusion of intelligence. Um, so what do we know about the brain? The brain is a really good pattern matcher. And this is both good and bad, right? When it sees things, it will recognize repetition. It will recognize that it's seen this thing before, and it will try and categorize things, right? This is where stereotyping comes from. Um, so when it sees something that looks like a strategy, um, or a you know, clever tactic, maybe just by coincidence. It's gonna recognize that as a tactic and think that it was intentional, um, which, which, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, which gets at the next point, which is the brain anthropomorphizes everything. I actually said that right this time. Um, so it sees, whenever it sees anything, it's, so it sees human-like intelligent behavior. So it sees that strategy, and it's gonna anthropomorphize it, right? It's gonna see <coughs> intent and intelligence behind the fact that this strategy occurred. Um, even though it could be coincidence, right? This is what happens in, in Vegas. People think they get unlucky winning streaks, right? There's really no such thing as a winning streak in random numbers. Um, there are streaks, they're naturally occurring, and when one happens, our brain interprets it as having more meaning than it really does. Um, there's a downside to this too, though, which is that the brain doesn't store memory the way a computer stores memory, right? It doesn't store discrete facts perfectly in little cells and then you know, recall them exactly. It creates a narrative of past event, and it sticks memory into that. And in fact, it will change the memory to match the narrative, which is a really creepy thing. But if you've ever had that fight with your wife where you're convinced that one thing happened, and she's convinced that the other happened, probably both of you remember it exactly the way you think you did, the way you think you do because of this, right? Because your brain is not doing you a favor. It's remembering things not exactly how how it wants them to have happened. Um, so if the brain has been putting together 
this notion of it seeing, you know, oh, this looks like a, a diversionary attack. This looks like a flanking attack, right? And so it's telling itself the story about this intelligent behavior that's going on. And then these characters head off in some other direction and it's not an attack at all. All of a sudden, the AI looks really, really stupid. There might be a good reason for that. But if we don't let the player know what's going on, why the AI is making the decisions it is, then they're going to come up with their own assumptions. And they may come to the conclusion that the AI is dumb. Right? If you see the AI walking down a hall and it just turns around and goes the other way, maybe there's a good reason. Right? Humans do that sometimes. Um, but it looks stupid. It looks indecisive. Um, so unless they know why, they're going to think that it was stupid. Um, a great example of this is from the first game I worked on was Master of Orion 3, um, which was a horrible game, by the way. Um, it was a really ambitious game, and we fell short. We just, we just didn't get there. Um, we even, I mean, my boss supported a year of extra development on the game out of his own pocket, um, and we still didn't get there. Um, so, you know, it was, so you could play it. It was sort of a game and sold some copies, um, but it wasn't a great game. Um, but it had some really great things in it. Um, so, so Master of Orion 3 is a turn-based strategy game where you're trying to take over the galaxy, right? So you go and you colonize other planets, um, and there are others, other races of aliens that are also doing the same thing, and you fight wars with them, and, and eventually you win or lose. Um, so one of the things that you want as the AI developer um, is you want to get this sort of um, space drama feel of there are distinct regions, right? Like if you think about Star Trek, right? The Klingons live over here, and the Romulans live over here, and there's a demilitarized zone, and I don't remember Star Trek that well, so I'm sure I'm getting it wrong, I apologize to Star Trek folks. But the idea is, right, you've got distinct empires and, and space in between them, right? And it, we wanted the same thing. We want the Mershans to be over here, and the Alcari to be over here, and the players maybe playing the humans, and they're down here. Um, so, Unfortunately, every star system has lots of planets. And especially in Master of Orion 3, different races like different kinds of planets. So there's one race, for instance, that really likes gas giants. Most races can't live on gas giants, right? Humans kind of don't like gas giants. But this race loves gas giants because they're huge. And because they live there naturally, right, they're good farming worlds for them. Uh, and their population grows really quickly. And so if there was a, a gas giant planet deep inside the human empire, they'd be like, OK, yeah, I'll go colonize there, because the humans wouldn't have already taken it. And so you get these sort of intermeshed, interwoven empires. And, and not only does that not look good, right? it doesn't look right, um, but also it's a really stupid strategic move, because now the human player is going to be like, OK, thank you for colonizing that planet. I'm going to take it over now, right? because I've got all my system defenses around it, and, and you're way overextended. Um, so that worked really, really well. And, and um, because the, the, the stars were connected using star lanes, um, the galaxy was basically just a graph. And you could walk the graph to find the edges of the you know, choke points and, the, and things like that. Um, I actually wrote up the algorithm in AI Game Programming Wisdom 2, if anybody's curious. And you can still find a copy of the book. I think it's out of print. Um, but, um, but the same AI was used for the player who could turn on auto-colonization. And when they turn on auto-colonization, then it would send their colony ships out for them. And we got all these complaints back from testing saying the AI is really stupid because there's this really great gas giant planet just two systems over, and it ignored it. And instead, it built on this dinky little Terran planet that only has a population of 12. Right? Why would it do that? So the problem here is not that the AI was stupid. The problem was that the AI didn't make sense to the player. The player didn't understand why the thing it was doing was smart. Um, and maybe that the smart thing is different, right? Because the player doesn't care about having pretty borders. But he does care about strategic considerations. Um, so what we ended up doing was turning off that part of the AI and just having the, um, when you're doing auto colonization, just pick the best planet you can find. Um, and when you're controlling an AI's colonization, then you do all that strategic stuff. We could have tried to explain it to the player or give them knobs and buttons, but this game already had way too many knobs and buttons, um, so we didn't. Um, and also, we were way over scheduled. All right, so I promised some concrete examples. We may even have time for all three. Um, but I wanted to start with Boxy Dog. Um, so Boxy Dog is something we made at uh, Blue Fang Games, um, where we had built like, Zoo Tycoon, Zoo Tycoon 2, uh, a bunch of expansion packs for both. So we were really into Animal AI. Um, really good at animal AI. 
But we also felt like there were a lot of disadvantages and drawbacks in the AI that we had. We wanted our animals to feel more organic and more believable. Uh, we wanted higher quality behavior. We wanted to be able to do things like train the animals. Um, so in between projects, we were doing a little bit of, of a research project trying to invent what we call our next generation animal AI. Um, this effort was led by Bruce Blumberg, who's previously at the MIT Media Lab, uh, who you will see in the video. Um, so we were, you know, this is just a demo. And in the interest of fast iteration, we made this little uh, dog out of something like nine boxes. Um, you know, the boxes aren't even connected. But the advantage of this was that our animators could turn out animation for this guy really, really fast. We were getting, you know, eight, nine, ten high quality animations a day. Um, so we could get lots and lots of content really quickly and we could iterate really, really quickly, which was awesome. Um, we wanted the character to feel like a bouncy little puppy dog. We were you know, mentally targeting like, if anybody remembers way back in the 90s, dogs with a Z, um, where you know, or Nintendogs was a, was a later one, right? Where you, most of the gameplay is just playing with your puppy and giving them treats and teaching them tricks and taking them for walks, right? That was the kind of thing we were imagining. Um, puppies don't move in straight lines very much, right? So we didn't want, you know, no straight lines, no path planning. Puppies don't move along intentional paths. They kind of bounce back and forth and sniff the squirrels. And, um, no docking, right? Bruce would say that ships dock, animals don't dock. So the, the puppy goes underneath the sofa from time to time, right? But he shouldn't, you know, go to the specific docking spot and then play the go under the sofa animation, because um, that looks wrong. It needs to be more organic than that. Um, and we also wanted a very simple emotional model. So we wanted this puppy to be sort of a scaredy cat, right? He's, he just brought him into the, brought him home, so he's in this new environment for the first time. He's very energetic, he's very excited, but he's also sort of anxious. Um, so, um, unfortunately, Bruce talks over this entire video, uh, which is good and bad. The bad is that you can't really hear the sound from the video, but the good is that what Bruce is telling me is describing is really the experience we want the player to have. So it's not necessarily what we build under the covers, but it's what we want the player to feel like we built, right? It's the illusion that we're trying to give. So without further ado. From um, from the past, he's a typical kind of terrier. He's um, well known he's master of the universe and has some things on that he's a weenie. Now, um, when I get the space bar, um, Basically, what I can do is encourage him to come out from under the uh, couch. Um, I don't really have this confidence. Okay, what did you just see there? Well, one of the important things to know is that there's no script running. Um, the Jack is figuring out what to do based on his, at every instant, based on his emotional state and um, what's going on in, um, in his world. So when he's under the couch, he's under there because that's a safe place and his confidence is low. When I hit the space bar, I'm basically um, encouraging him and providing positive reinforcement. So his confidence is going up. But you know, if you watched him, you could see him going back and forth. So there's sort of a uh, little battle between me giving him encouragement and uh, his um, and his confidence. But eventually, he comes out. Why does he approach me? Because um, I'm the person in the room. I'm the most interesting thing there. So he comes up to me and he solicits me for um, for attention. And then the ball comes into the world, and all of a sudden that confidence that got built up goes right back down, and when it goes right back down, he goes to the um, safest um, um, place he, um, he knows. Okay, so um, Jack's um, under the couch now, and uh, you'll notice that he's alternating his attention between me and the ball. Um, this is built on the game engine. This, this isn't demo um, uh, where. Um, this is built on the... Uh, on the uh, on our game engine using our tools, you'll notice that uh, we've incorporated the Havoc engine into our, um, into our system. Um, as I um, hit the ball, Jack's uh, attention follows the um, ball. I now I'm the encouragement to come out. He comes out and he um, starts playing with the ball. And you'll see when he gets close to the ball that sometimes he goes to a play bow. He's sort of um, soliciting the play bow, um, soliciting the ball for uh, to see, you know, is this something that's fun to play with? Is it a threat? Um, he's doing very much what a dog does when he has a new object in his world and sort of figuring out, well, what is this new object? You know, you're hearing that yelp, it's because the ball did something unexpected. So it keeps going for a while, but I'll pause it there. Um, 
So what was going on under the covers? Um, we didn't have any path planning. Right? We didn't build path planning at all um, because we didn't want him to move in those kinds of ways. Um, but we also didn't even have collision avoidance. So we just defined a rectangle in the middle of this room where he was allowed to move. And any animation that would take him out of that rectangle, we wouldn't play. Um, so he could only move around sort of the middle of the room. If the ball got in the corner, um, he couldn't interact with it. So he would, he would either do a play bow, or he would sit, or he would come over to you and sort of look mournful until you moved the ball for him. Um, and then in order to move around, we would pick an animation that got his nose closer to where the ball is. Um, so we didn't do any animation blending. We didn't do any exact turns. We had you know, a turn 15 and a turn 30 and a turn 45 and a turn 90, right? Those are the number of degrees that the turn is going to do. Um, and then he's going to pick the turn animation that gets him going in basically the right direction. Uh, or sometimes he gets it wrong. And he, you know, he does a big loop around the ball. And that, you know, dogs do that. So that was fine. Um, what else? Something to notice, I mean, I talked a lot about experience, just everything else that goes into this experience, right? We've got this boxy dog, and now we want to create a demo that we're going to show to a potential publisher. So the art style, right, is very much around the boxy dog, the type of, you know, the lighting approach that we took. Um, we spent a lot of time tuning the physics to get the beach ball to feel like a beach ball, and the sound effect for when you hit the beach ball. Um, you know, little things like that make a big, big difference. You end up with this demo that was fun to play around with the dog. Um, we also, as I said, we had a, a simple anxiety versus excitement model. Um, so you could graph them on a two-dimensional graph. And in fact, we had a tool for the designers that did exactly that. So they could drop behaviors in and say, you know, when he's low anxiety, low excitement, you know, this is a candidate behavior. When he's high anxiety, low excitement, you know, this is a candidate behavior, and that would be the going to the cell phone behavior. Um, and, and so on, right? And so that was how they could sort of position um, when the behaviors would be picked. Um, the model was really, really simple. Uh, excitement would go up when you hit the space bar, um, and there was VO that went along with that. You could sort of hear some of that, right? Come on, pooch, it's okay. Right, that was actually our art director. <laughs> he recorded all that VO. Um, but, they, but every time you hit the space bar, you'd get an utterance, um, and his excitement would go up a little bit. Um, every time the ball hit him, and he did not intend to hit it, so how did we measure that? If his animation would carry him into the ball, then he meant to hit it. If his animation would not carry him into the ball, then he did not intend to hit it, and his anxiety would go up. Right? So it's these sort of simple little things that you can find in the world and then attach meaning to that develops into the story, the, the experience that you're trying to craft. Um, so I think that's all I've got to say about Boxy Dog. Um, the next one up is Angry Granny. Um, do I have to, I just barely, is it okay if I go a couple minutes over? Or should we skip Angry Granny? Um, you got about right. 10 minutes. I was going to say, if anybody really needs to leave at, at 3, then, then that's fine. I won't feel bad. Um, but I'll do, I'll do Angry Granny really, really quickly, because I think she's interesting. So this is something we did at Lockheed. Um, this is a mixed reality character. Um, so we project the character on the wall. Um, we have what's called a short throw projector, which means it can be very, very close to the screen, um, so that the, the Marines wouldn't get in between the screen and the character. Um, and they're actually moving around the environment. So, they, so they've come out to her house. Uh, looking for an insurgent. Yeah, there's a longer backstory, but I won't go, through, go into it. Um, and and uh, you know, some of the training is around things like they're taught they need to win hearts and minds. And in Afghanistan, you don't go into a woman's home when the man's not there. Right? It may be sexist, but that's what their culture is. Um, so ordinarily, the Marines would never, ever, ever do this. But they have hard intelligence that there's an insurgent who lives there. And there was an IED that went off a week earlier. Um, so in this situation, they should. And we had one set of Marines who went in and saw Granny, and she's screaming at them. Um, and they were like, oh, sorry, man, we didn't mean to bother you, and they left, right? And that was not the right thing to do in that situation. Um, so that's, you know, that's the training we're trying to give. Um, we previously had some of these mixed reality characters, but they were very fast-paced shoot or no-shoot scenarios, right? You come into the room, um, the guy's waving a gun around. Well, people in Afghanistan often own guns. That's not a reason to shoot him. You come into the room, and the guy's threatening a hostage with a gun. That is a reason to shoot him. You come into the room and he's got a, something under his vest that looks like an explosive. That's a reason to shoot him, right? And he's got a button in his hand, um, you know, or other, right? So, so those kinds of, they're over in five seconds. This character needed to be alive the whole time they searched the room, so 15, 20 minutes. Um, it was very low budget, so we had a very limited amount of dialogue that we needed to be able to reuse. Um, and we wanted her to feel organic and believable, right? We didn't want visible repetition. We didn't want them noticing and treating her like a computer character. We wanted them to interact with her as if she were real. 
up to and but short of actually trying to dive on an current tackler, right? Because then they hit the wall. Um, and Marines have been known to do things like that, so we have to be a little careful. Um, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself again. All right, so video. Um, this, by the way, isn't live. This was me playing around on my computer to make a video. And she goes on, so the Marines question her for a little while, and then they call into iron headquarters and, and get told to let her go. Um, so it, there's a lot going on there, right? I, I've got old papers <laughs> about Angry Granny. Um, but I want to unpack a little bit of what's going on. Um, so what I really want to focus on is the, here is the AI pieces, so keeping the character alive. right? So we've got a collection of dialogue. Um, it's all in Pashto, which is an advantage because most of us don't speak Pashto, including most Marines aren't fluent. So we can get away with some non sequiturs and things like that um, that had the translator snickering, but the Marines mostly didn't notice too much, thankfully. Um, and then we have a collection of, of gestures, and we didn't want to build, match the you know, build gesture for each line of dialogue um, for reasons that I don't have time to go into. Um, the dialogue was recorded from a voice actor, but not the same one that gave us the final dialogue. The first voice actor we did it in the wrong language. Um, she spoke, spoke Farsi, not Pashtu. Um, so, so we couldn't, but even if we could have, we wouldn't have wanted to. Because when you hear the same line of dialogue again, we want it to seem like it's being said again. So we, do it a couple of we did a couple of things, right? We had multiple takes of each line of dialogue. Usually whenever you, you hire a voice actor, you'll get three or four takes of every line. So instead of picking the best take, we just used every single take. So when she says the second line again, it's a second recording, it sounds a little different. Um, also, we tagged all of the animation with the types of you know, characteristics when they're appropriate, right? Like this is you know, sort of a pray to Allah, so if she's mentioning Allah, this is an appropriate, right? If get out of my house, right? This is an appropriate gesture, right? And so we tagged all the gestures, we tagged all the lines of dialogue. And then when you play a line of dialogue, we just pick a random sequence of gestures. And we were very worried about, you know, something that was mentioned in the, in the talk this morning, of making sure that the, the beat of the gesture matches the beat of the dialogue, right? And everybody says this is really important and you're not going to get it. Um, we had a bunch of people compliment us, I mean, repeatedly, on how well we did that. This was one of those moments of, we did absolutely nothing to make that happen. But every now and then, and you can see some cases in the video where it happens, by coincidence. Um, and the brain, oh, look, a pattern, right? Oh, the beat matches, how nice. Um, so when it happens, the brain notices, and the pattern matches. And, and you remember that. When it doesn't happen, gesture doesn't always exactly match, match speech. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, so it's not a big deal. Um, so that actually just sort of fell out. Um, 
We got away the, the lip sync was another thing. Right? We just had a really a single draw flap animation um, because she's got the the um, the turban. I forget what it's called over over her face. Um, you can't really see the lips that well. We had a bunch of people talk about how good the lip sync was, and if you watch closely, it's horrible. Um, but you know, people didn't notice. Um, and then we had a few large behaviors that we could mix in. Um, the if they aimed weapons at her, you know, please, I have nothing, right? And then if they did that again, then we had some other responses that were less lengthy. Um, when they find contraband, there's a bit about 23 second long sequence when she starts crying and praying. Um, they, you know, it's going to be played, but it's only going to be played once. Um, so we can craft that moment very carefully um, and then just insert it. Um, and we had a, a set of sensors for telling where the, the, um, the trainees were as they moved around in the room. So we could tell when they were close to contraband, she would get more nervous, the hand ringing would get bigger, and she would pick different lines of dialogue that were harsher and louder. Um, and when they were farther away, she'd calm down a little bit. Um, so, you know, again, very simple emotional model to add some variety to that sort of ongoing ranting. So, the last one I want to show you is a little bit of Red Dead Redemption. Um, so this is, you know, hopefully most people are familiar with, with Red Dead, a very big open world uh, sandboxy role play kind of a game made by uh, Rockstar, the same company that makes Grand Theft Auto. Um, like most Rockstar games, it's not particularly politically incorrect. Or, sorry, politically correct, so I, I apologize for some of that. Um, it wouldn't have been my choice, but sometimes you end up on the project you end up on. Um, but we really wanted to have a very rich, dynamic living environment, right? When you're at a ranch, we wanted people at the ranch working, doing stuff all around you, um, going about their lives, right? So it felt like you're here visiting this ranch, you know, having stuff that happens. Not like the whole world revolves around you. Um, and by the way, every single character was distinct, right? There, there was no duplication of models. There was no duplication of voices. We had an enormous amount of VO. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a, a, a large budget. Um, so, um, you know, that again was trying to create some of that uniqueness. So, I will remember not to spoil the next thing by clicking the slides this time. I apologize for the bad camera control. It turns out I suck at Xbox. Speaking the truth now. I said, I don't know. Right So what did you see going on there? There we go. Okay, well, there's this guy over here pitching hay, right? It turns out he, when you've got a big pile of hay, you've got to turn it over or the, the underneath part rots. Um, this guy over here is fixing the fence, right? There looks like a loose board. He's, he's pounding in nails, fixing it up. Um, this guy looks like he's on his way over here to the, this corral, corral to, to get a horse. Um, and on the way, he stops and he's chatting with his friend as he walks by, right? He's, You're speaking the truth now. I didn't hear what they were talking about, but I heard that much at least. Um, and even the you know the, the NBC right, it's it's hot, the dust is blowing, um, it's it's the desert in Nevada. Um, he's wiping the sweat off his brow, right? Which that little bit of behavior does an enormous amount to ground you, right? To 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 bring you into the world. Um, over here, right? There's this, what is this guy doing? He's sticking his head in the horse trough, right? Why is he? Well, it's hot out. 
right? He's, he's probably trying to cool off, or maybe he's washing his hair. Um, this guy is, is sharpening a knife. Uh, he's, it looks like maybe he's a blacksmith. Uh, he's probably helping one of the locals who has a dull knife that needs to be sharpened. He's got a sharpening stone. Maybe he is one of the locals. Um, and he's a friendly guy, right? As I walk by, he says, howdy. Right? And that was one of the things the game designers really clearly wanted. Right? This is a Western game, like the Western movies. When you walk down the street, people should say howdy. <laughs> right? That's what they do. Um, not too often. Right? Same with wiping the sweat. Right? Not too often. Right? Because we don't want to key that pattern matching and have it seem repetitive and unrealistic. Um, we don't want that. One of their earlier games was Bully. And in Bully, as you became more famous, characters would look at you more until at the end you're, you're riding your bike through town and everybody's staring at you everywhere you go. Like, what? I didn't do anything, really. I, I'm off to paint some graffiti, but I didn't do anything yet. So we didn't want to go that far, um, but, but we wanted that feel. Um, so what's going on under the covers? Well, we had lots and lots and lots of hot spots, sort of like the Sims. Um, that are just embedded in the environment and have a, a little behavior tree with a little bit of behavior on it, right? So there's a hot spot on this uh, pile of hay and there's a pitchfork sitting next to it. Um, and the characters at the high level are running a Telio reactive, basically a rule base, right? A long list of, of predicate action. Uh, it goes down the list until the first predicate that fires and then it does that action. Um, so, you know, up at the top is things like react to being shot at and uh, like that woman that I ran into, react to somebody bumping into me, that whole, you know, sir, I'm a lady, right? That's up higher in the Telio reactive system. And then down low is, okay, if I got nothing else to do, go find a hotspot. Um, so this character went and found a hotspot, right? There's no intent, there's no deeper thought, there's no cognition going on here. He went and found a hotspot, and the behavior is built into the hotspot. The behavior has enough variety um, to keep them alive, right? So we didn't want the hotspot to feel repetitive, so there's a bunch of different animation and some randomness in there. Um, this is another hotspot. This one is, I think, a lot simpler. Um, he's just pounded in a nail. It's not a loose board, right? He's just pounded in a, a hammer appears in his hand when he starts the hotspot, right? I mean, you know, we cheat in small ways. Um, but, it, but the feel is right, and players forgive that kind of stuff pretty routinely these days. Um, this guy is just on a random wander. So sometimes instead of doing a hotspot, um, farther down in the TR was just pick a spot off in the distance and go there. And then when you get close to it, pick a new spot. Um, I think there was some logic to try and make it not look too much like a U-turn um, and go there. Um, so he's just on a random wander. He's probably not going into the corral. But the, the story that my brain would tell me if I just looked at the part and we watched would, might tell me that he is. Um, and this is just a random fidget, right? With random fidgets, you have to be careful to have a lot of them, to not do them too often, so you don't get the same fidget all the time, or it looks fake. Even though humans do the same animation all the time, AIs can't get away with it. Um, so that's a problem. Um, Nathan's telling me I should stop. So, <laughs> really, really, really quick. Um, another hot spot, there was an attention AI, there was a greeting AI, there was a conversation AI. Those were higher up in the teleoreactive system that could pull characters off or interact with the other things, so a character on a hot spot could do that stuff too. Um, it was important to us to get the, a big part of getting them embodied in the world is getting them looking at things around them. Um, but what they look at can be pretty random most of the time, unless there's something important going on. Uh, so, moving on. I'll be glad to talk about that more with folks after. Um, quickly, um, resources that are out there. Uh, probably the easiest place to start is the Game AI Pro books. Um, so these are books that are written mostly by developers, um, but, but also academics. We put a new one out about every two years. Uh, full disclosure, I'm one of the section editors. Uh, I'm also an author, but I get no money for it, so it doesn't really matter to me if you buy it, except that I hope that it's helpful to you because we put a lot of work into these um, to, to try, and, try and help people. Um, so the reason we get no money is after two years, our deal with the publisher is we can put all the articles up for free on GameAIPro.com. So the first book is all up on GameAIPro for free. All the articles are there. The second book, I believe, goes up this spring. The third book will be released this spring, probably, I'm guessing, April or May. We always target GDC, but I, knowing what I know, I don't think we're going to make this chicken. I don't think we're going to make it. Um, there's also older books, AI Game Programming Wisdom, Game Gems. Um, AI Game Programming Wisdom was the exact same thing, but a different publisher. Um, and without the, the uh, put it up for free model. Um, so there was a lot of them around print, and, and Amazon and the automatic algorithms being what they are, they're expensive. I think there might be Kindle versions now. Um, the GDC AI Summit is you know, probably the prominent industry conference. 
Um, for game developers to get that, I mean, GDC certainly is in the AI summit, is, is one of the biggest, most successful summits there. Um, again, everything gets reported and put up, all of GDC, not just the AI summit, and put up on the GDC vault, and after a year, it's free. Um, so you can go to the GDC vault, and there is an enormous amount of content about everything to do with game development, business, uh, rendering, art, sound, AI, you name it, animation, everything. Um, so that's an incredible resource to go online. Um, but when I went and looked last week to confirm the address, it was down. Um, so apparently, I, they, used to, they used to use a Flash movie player, which I knew because it doesn't work on a lot of uh, web browsers. Um, they're updating their, their video player, so hopefully it'll be back up sooner. It's already back up. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is AIGameDev.com, which is a 4K site run by Alex Schampendart. There's a ton of information on there. Um, Alex is one guy. He's got his own set of biases. I don't agree with him about everything. Um, but he's very smart, and he does lots of really, really good interviews with a lot of other smart people. Um, there are also forums there, which are not a bad place to go and ask newbie questions about stuff, so, um, or even experience questions about stuff, or start conversations. Um, so that stuff is out there, and that's all I've got. We're a little bit over, but we can take one or two questions. Sure. Uh, what game you played recently uh, gave you a, a thinking of like, uh, oh, they did a great job at AI, they do something new in the video game industry? Um, but for Dead was a good example. They did a lot of really interesting stuff with their drama management. Um, so, so Left for Dead um, was very much about, as I said, that sense of teamwork. And you, there were only a couple of maps. And it basically, the game was, for those who haven't played it, um, was you get dropped into the map, and you and three other people, usually human players, although bots could fill in if you didn't have four players, um, had to get to some extraction point. And then you did it again, and you did it again. And the, the zombies were all placed dynamically, um, based in part on how good you were, right? How accurate was your shooting and things like that. Paste, placed in bar, part on some sense of dramatic arc, as were the, the resources um, and, and the bosses. And so that was that was a really interesting project. Um, they gave a great talk at GDC, which is probably up on the ball, though it might be too long ago. Um, so you can go find it. Yes? Um, awesome talk, thank you. I want to go into the same thing that you sort of put centers on the side, though. And um, so then, principle, you could use machine learning for game behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but the industry doesn't tend to. Could you give any insight as to why and whether you think given the recent advances what about the change? So, so personally, my opinion, um, and not all of the industry agrees with me, um, is that machine learning is the wrong tool. But I don't know a lot about machine learning and I look forward to being proved wrong. Um, so having said that, right, I'll, I'll tell you why. So um, when I'm doing machine learning, Right? I'm trusting the machine to find the solution. Basically, I'm giving it a, a set of examples and, and some heuristics and saying crunch on this stuff and find the solution. Right? I mean, that's probably an oversimplification. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Um, but then they, there's the, you, what do I do when the designer comes in and changes the game? Right? So now I've got to give it some new examples and hope that it learns. Um, or what, but what do I do when the designer comes and says, well, but in this situation, I want to write. So, so the attention system in Red Dead was full of this, right? We want the characters looking at the environment around them, all right? Um, pick a random uh, entity, right? Could be an animal, could be a human, and look at it for eight to 12 seconds, numbers I picked out of a hat, right? I'm not sure if that was the actual time. And then look at something else. When you pick something else, pick something that see, you know, the angle is sufficiently different um, then it's a change in attention, right? And that gets the characters looking around and engaged and have a slightly higher priority for looking at the player, but not overwhelmingly so, depending on how famous he is. Um, and then, well, but what if the player is dragging a prisoner behind him? Well, what if the player is engaged in gunfight? Well, what if uh, a horse crashes into something? Well, what if, right? So there were all of these what ifs. Um, and even with hand tuning, they kind of ate us alive, although, Really, that was because I naively assumed that there wouldn't be, so I didn't build a very robust system. Um, and I really regretted that later. I made the decision early on to just do, I mean, basically, a message sequence. Uh, there was one of those cases where I, this, is, this isn't going to get complicated, and then it did. Um, you know, with machine learning, 
You get, so now I have to figure out what examples do I give it or how do I change the heuristic to get it to learn the right thing. Trust that in the process I won't lose something else that it had already learned. Right? That kind of thing is really hard. Um, so machine learning is one of those things that always comes up at the AI roundtables at GDC. Um, and lately I've heard some industry guys, you know, for a long time the, the industry guys would just sort of groan like, do we have to talk about this again? Lately I've heard some industry guys getting excited about it again. Um, but it's more a, a, there are places where it works well. Um, fighting games, I think, can use machine learning reasonably well to predict what the player's going to do. Driving games to, to find the path around the course. Um, but, but it's sort of a particular instances tool. Sure. Let's actually cut it off here. You guys can talk after. Okay. We, have a, we have 15 minutes left in the break. If you have a poster for the poster session, you can set it up now, or you can set it up after we finish the next set of sessions. Um, otherwise, come back in 15 minutes for the next session.